Amen and amen and amen. What a joy it is to come again this uh, Lord's Day, and particularly on this Communion Sunday morning. We want to take this time to give glory and honor and be a witness of God's goodness, of God's grace, and God's mercy towards us. If it was not for His grace, we wouldn't be here this morning. I wouldn't be standing behind this pulpit. Thank God for His mercy. What I want to speak today in continuation of what I had started, but particularly talking about the tone curtain or the veil of the tabernacle or the temple and the newness or the new covenant or the new testament cut in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to continue on, but specifically with regard to this time of communion, talking about what it implies, the stone veil or curtain of the Old Testament, the temple, and what it means to us. So I'll be running through scriptures, and I thought I'll read personally from the Bible, but you can follow it from the Bible you have or from the e-board. And quite a few scriptures, but I just want to make sure I remain true to the scriptures. My passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27 and verse 51. I would read from verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, healed up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The second that you have, what Mark has written in Mark chapter 16, uh, 15 and verse 38. And the veil, or I will read from verse 37, and Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And then from Luke's description that is found in Luke chapter 23 and verse 45. I will read from verse 41, just one verse before. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. What an opportunity that we have to go through this word. And I want you to understand whether it was Matthew or Mark or Luke, they talk about in just one verse. But that one verse, whether it is Matthew chapter 23 or 27, verse 51, or whether it be Mark chapter 15, 38, or whether it be Luke chapter 23 and verse, 50, uh, verse 55, 45, they all refer to the tone or rent veil or curtain in the temple and what it means. With darkness, earthquake, and rocks being rent, they become very important. I want to just say how important it is, particularly when you think that this has been a curtain or the veil or the temple veil, as they call it, has been there for years and years. Uh, people know it. Without it, there would not be a temple uh, where the at Day of Atonement would be celebrated, where the t priest would walk in. Now, I want you to understand what it means is the three rooms or what would be called the chambers, the outer court, the inner court, and the innermost, or the holy place, or the most holy place. Outer court, you have a lot of washing, a lot of things that takes place, it is out, but as you come inside, you look into the inner court, and there are three articles that priest goes to perform on a daily basis. But the inner court, or the innermost, most holy place, is a very important object, and that is to do with the Ark of the Mercy, that basically the mercy seat upon which the blood was sprinkled. One time a year by the high priest on the day of Pentecost, on the day of atonement. Now I want to say this importantly because the passages we read in Matthew and Mark and Luke talk about 
the veil that is rent. One scripture, and yet it has so much of power-packed words that mean so much. And you find when the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is finished, that very moment he gave up his spirit, and the temple veil was split, not from down up, from top down. Simply speaking, it was not man's doing. It was the work of God, and the very moment he said what he had said in his final words, finished, that simply brings to a climax a change of the old priest, a change of the Aaronic, or a change of the laws, or change of what would be the old covenant of all the rituals and things that have to do with the civil and ceremonial, or with the dietary, or with the things to do with the animal, so many things that are good. But it does not pertain to salvation. It was important for the Old Testament church. But when you look at what took place on that very day, comes the commencement, the old passes and the new is in. It's a new epoch, a new era, and we'll be talking about it. I have to say this particularly, Hebrews has a whole lot to do with what takes place in the Torah, particularly to do with the temple, the priest, and uh, the garments of the priest, priest, and what these priests imply, and particularly the ultimate after the order of Melchizedek, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. But if I read from Matthew chapter 9, it gives you a division of both the inner and the innermost. That is simply the holy place and the most holy place, and the articles mentioned and what it implies to us today. So the writer of the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1, Then verily the first covenant, that is the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, add also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, literal worldly sanctuary. It was provisional, it was not permanent. But it was worldly, whereas what we find is the later is greater temple, it is spiritual. And so let's read verse uh, 2. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, that's the inner coat, and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, that's the inner sanctuary. What you find in this passage were priests that were ministering. We don't have time to check in, but Luke chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 talks about the company of Abidab and simply Zechariah being called out, 18 to 20,000 priests were summoned at any time, particularly in lots in 24, 24, that would mean about 250 per course. And out of that, there would be people that be called, there was showbread had to be changed daily, there was incense that had to be put up every day, 24 hours, that, that the incense will be lit being, you can see it outside for a long distance, and then the lights have to be, it can never be darkened. So there were three that pertained to the showbread, and two that made sure the light was there and the incense was done. And you find that particular day in Luke chapter 1, that lot fell upon Zechariah. The lot fell on him, and it was a great honor and great privilege with uh, 20, 18,000 to 20,000, that surely is a privilege. And the lots were cast, the Bible says, and the Lord chose Zechariah, and he was in, not in the inner court, in the most court, or the most holy, but outer court, he was not the high priest, Caiaphas was. So what you find in this occasion as this takes place, here is Hebrew uh, chapter 9, moving on, after that, in verse 3, the second veil, and that is what we're talking about. And it says here, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant that is overlaid, and this is called the Ark of Mercy, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was gold pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that parted, and the tables of covenant. So this is important, and they were inside. And over it, the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. This is the mercy seat on which Aaron uh, uh, and his ch fam children would be for the years putting blood on that mercy seat. And says here that uh, over the ch cherubims of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. 
Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always about the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. That's in the outer, or would be the inner one. But unto the second, that is the most holiest of holy, or called the holiest of holies, when the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he himself offered for himself and for the errors of his people. So there was blood for him, the blood of bulls, because he was sinful. And then for the people, the blood of goats that would be applied seven times over the mercy seat. And you find here, the verse 8, the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of holiest was not yet made manifest, not yet made manifest as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So the first tabernacle was still standing. It was brought down in 70 AD, according to the words of the Lord in prophecy. Verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now in verse 10 and verse 1, for the law being a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things that can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers perfect. So this was not a perfect and it was a provisional, not permanent. They were waiting for the ultimate, the one that would come, the temple, the priest, and the offering, the sacrifice. So they were all a shadow of things to come. What I want you to realize is when you read Mark chapter 15 and verse 38, the temple veil was rent and simply says from top to bottom. It cannot be the work of some individuals. By the way, from what we could gather from a Mishnah in the writings, you find that it was uh, a temple of Solomon was 40 feet high, but by the time you come to the temple of Herod, it was six, 60 feet high. And here, the veil, the curtain, was 60 feet height and 30 feet in width. And you find uh, the, the, uh, the, the strength of it was something like the hand of a, of a man from, uh, from the big uh, to the uh, tiny little finger. It basically could be four to six feet, uh, six inch if you want. And it is made of pure linen. And you find in it, it is uh, made with uh, what would be the color that was prescribed in the Torah, in the laws of Moses. And that was blue and purple and simply red or scarlet. These were the three colors prescribed. And there were basically some sort of embroidery that was richly done. There's a pattern for all of this. And you find this was something that had been there from the days of uh, Solomon uh, and then comes into a bigger way into King uh, the Herod's temple. What you find about this is it is very weighty. And by the time it was raised up, it takes 300 priests to lift it up. It's not a small little thing. Every part of this veil signifies just as the garments of the priest and the high priest signifies very important details about the Lord Jesus Christ, as does the temple, as does the sacrifices. All of them is a pointer and speak of one aspect of the priestly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ from the blood on. There's something that you find is that the veil was thrown. And what is so significant is when you turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and, and verse 20, I want you to listen to what it says. It says here, uh, by the new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now we get a picture. The Hebrew tells us that was a picture, the veil was of his own body, including the temple, was a picture of him. And of course, the Jews of those days misunderstood when Jesus Christ was telling the fulfillment. In three days, I will raise it up, destroy this body in three days. And they 
uh, misunderstood it to be that this one will burn down the building or bring down the building, but how could he build it in three days? And so that was one of those false witness against him. However, what he was talking about was his body, which came to pass. And when you look at this veil, it says, let me read this again in verse, 10, verse 20, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh, his body. So because of that, what happened to him on the cross, and by the shedding of the blood, the blood of the New Testament, we have access to the innermost, the most holy place. And this is remarkable, particularly when you realize all of that entrails about the first thing that we call the veil. The second point I want you to know is a veil or a curtain simply implies that no admission, no going here. And you find simply it was common or sinful man have no excess because of sin. And by nature, we have come short of the glory of God. We have all fallen one way or the other. It's not the measure of how great, but it's simply we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And so you find those blockage when you run through the Bible, particularly when you see the intrinsic fellowship between God and the first man and woman. It was what was deemed the greatest plan of God until sin destroyed it. But when you see sin entered, something took place. Not only did they find they were naked, the glory of God, the clothing that was of God just departed. They stood naked, nothing could cover them. It was all fig leaves, no matter what you cover yourself. And yet you find, after God had clothed them, talking about salvation and uh, what would be the prophetic messianic verse of the lamb that would be slain and be a covering for us, you see them being banished because they could not enjoy that fellowship face to face with God. And so you find the first blockage of the curtain comes in the form of a fiery sword that will keep them away from the Garden of Eden that you find in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24. And you find the cherubim, the Bible says, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. They could not enter. And you will find over and again when God visited, and that would be the pre-Christ coming down in glory, meeting with various people, he did, with Moses. But it was specifically told, tell the people don't come there, they would die, and some did, trying to make their way in. You find this very much aspect of why, because a holy God is holy, and man cannot, if we cannot face closer to the sun, sun only gets his reflection from the one who made it. And I want you to realize, no one can stand before the sun of righteousness. He is totally righteous, we'd be burned right away. Our sin will will totally burn us out. We stand before a holy, righteous God, but yet He's a merciful and gracious God, and He made these provision of what would be temporary measures by which our sins could be washed, but it has to be repeated year after year until the true priest comes, until the true temple comes, and until the true sacrifice is met. Until then, it is, goes on. One of the things we find is this very veil was a division between what would be the ordinary from the special one. That's the high priest. But the high priest had to make sure he himself was covered with the blood of the bull because he could be struck just in case. There was a rope tied to him. There were bells around him. If they didn't hear it, they would make sure that there's no more, and they'd pull him out. They would not enter the most holy place. And so you understand what God said, there I will commune with you. It was and could not be for all. Just one man, one year on the day of atonement. 
In every aspect of the festival that you find in the Old Testament is a picture of one aspect of our Lord, whether it be Passover or Pentecost or Tabernacle or the Day of Atonement. So number three, this implies not simply what the veil is and why there was a blockage called the veil, but number three, we find something upon about the atonement. In fact, when you turn to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, very interesting, from verse 2 we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Herod thy brother, that he come not at all times unto the place or the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I, nor for I will appear in the cloud upon mercy seat. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. It was an imperfect priest. You find he shall take, in verse 7, two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle for the congregation this time. So when you read verse 11, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, shall he kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Verse 13, And he shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord and upon the altar. Verse 14, He shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle with his finger upon the mercies eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Verse 15, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do so that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins, so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that, remain, that remaineth among them in the midst of the uncleanliness. And there shall no man in the tabernacle of the congregation go to make. So it's very specific law. Now, I want you to understand that was necessary because you find the wages of sin is death. Blood for blood. The blood of an animal for the blood of a yearning human. That's the way of redemption. And what is interesting is what Leviticus says is repeated in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Without the shedding of the blood... And let me read the whole thing. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission of forgiveness. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So look what took place. Even as the priests were ministering in that occasion, in the inner court, what you find is the temple veil was rent. The very moment, the real Paschal Lamb, even as the temple in the priest was basically bringing this and sprinkling, this is an atonement, this is a sacrifice which is done every day. But in this particular, take for example, Caiaphas and other priests were there at that time, Caiaphas being the high priest. And all of a sudden, that is on the day of the Passover when Jesus Christ died, and you find what is remarkable is the moment he finished his word, it is finished, and gave up his spirit after commending to the Father, there was a couple of things that took place. There was utter darkness in midday, rock began to rend, and there was earthquake. But in the temple, something else took place. The moment Jesus said, it is finished, the temple was, curtain was split. And we, meant, we talked about in chapter 10 and verse 20 of Hebrews how it was his body being rent. And that is significant, that is important. Let me read basically what the writer of Hebrews continues to say in chapter 9, verse 15, all the way to verse 17. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which were called might receive the promise 
of eternal inheritance. For there is a testament in there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. To have a new testament, there must be death. And this was the death of the testator. Otherwise, it will not be a force. And Jesus Christ died testifying of the new covenant and then rose up again to justify it. And what you find is, goes on to say in verse 17, for the testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated, so the first was not in this similar way. It was just the blood of bulls and goats. Number four, I want to talk about simply about something very important. That is to say, things changed. The very moment what took place a few uh, miles away, that is outside the gate in Golgotha, the real Paschal lamb was slain. And the moment he said it's finished, and what happened was a spear when his body was rent, literally pierced aside, the blood came out, the blood simply talks about redemption for us. There in the temple, what would be a shadow, a figure, a type, a symbol, was taking place at that very moment, a thunder, an earthquake, and all of that outside and inside, the entire temple veil was torn from top to bottom. And that's significant because this was a shadow of what was real, literally taking place. The Lamb of God, the temple, and the priest, and the blood, all put together on the cross on Golgotha of Calvary. Now understand this very important thing. A couple of changes took place. And the changes is unique because when you turn to chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews and verse 12, the priesthood changed from Aaron to the order of Melchizedek. In verse 12 it says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law of the old is moved into the law of the new covenant. And in verse 20, let me just say in verse 17, For he testified about the second priest, and that would be the ultimate priest, Thou art the priest after the order of Melchizedek. For there is dearly a discernment of the commandment going before of the weakness and unprofitableness. There. They were temporary. They were professional, provisional. And now comes the real. So when you read verse 24, But this man, because he continues ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. The priesthood has changed. We do not belong to the old Levitical order. And I find it so sort of amusing. People bring in the entire Old Testament, dress themselves as Levitical priesthood. In today's day, it would look like Santa Claus in white. But that doesn't suffice. The high priest of our calling is come and he has taken over as the priest. And what is so unique is we read a moment ago what chapter 9, he is also the testator that applies and what would be stamps his approval with his own blood. Let's read that again. Verse 16, for the testament there must be necessary in chapter 9 and verse 16, death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, uh, men are after, afterwards it is of no strength. And so you find Jesus Christ died and was thus tested and ratified the New Testament cut in his own blood. Something else you find is not only the priesthood has changed, not only everything to do with the law has changed, and the, New Test the Old Testament becomes the New Testament, the Old Covenant is replaced by the New Covenant, but something else is this is one of the greatest sacrifices. In fact, it is the perfect sacrifice. It is the greatest sacrifice. Every sacrifice that you find in the book of Leviticus was but a picture of the perfect sacrifice that would come. So when you read about this, incredibly amazing that you find that this is the New Testament in his blood. So when you read uh, chapter 7, and let me read verse 27 to 28, 
talking about the Lord Jesus, who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people, for this he did once when he entered up himself. For the law maketh men high priest which have infirmity, but the word of oath which was since the law maketh son who is consecrated forever. He is without sin. He is without blemish. He is the perfect Lamb of God. And he is also the priest of our calling. When you turn to chapter 9 and verse 12, listen to what it says here. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Not year after year, but once and for all, not a temporary, provisional, but an eternal redemption for us. You got to say hallelujah. You got to say amen. It's right to say hallelujah. It means so much to us today. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4 for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. That's the Old Testament. It was temporary. It was provisional. This is permanent. Because when you read chapter 10 and verse 10 of Hebrews, but the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Not Sunday after Sunday put to the cross and come back again once and for all. That suffice. After that, he sits down at the right hand of God the Father. You got to say hallelujah, hallelujah. And verse 10 and verse 14. By one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Perfected. Not halfway, not incomplete. It is perfected. And we are sanctified wholly because of the perfect blood, by the perfect priest, by the perfect sacrifice. And when you look at this, what an amazing Savior. Verse 14 goes on about this. He has offered and perfected. When you go to chapter 12 and verse 24, we could dwell here for a long time. Look here what it says in verse 24. And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, this is not the old covenant. The old covenant has passed away and now comes the new covenant. Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks much better things than of Abel. And then of Moses it says, and then all of the law and prophets. This is what we're talking about before we go to take communion. But there's a number five point I want to make is what would be the precious blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. It is not the blood of goats and bulls which were provisional, which were temporary, which had to be repeated. It was for a measure, for a time, for a season, for a dispensation, but it all pointed to what would be eternal, perpetual, and complete, and perfected. So what was so amazing is when you read what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your uh, leader, fathers, that's not the old ritual, no, you were not redeemed by that. He goes on to say in verse 8, 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And goes on to say in verse 20, Who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these times for you. So it says in Hebrews, For God has spoken in these last days to us by the prophets, and tells us that what's happening, that's how the book of Hebrew begins. What is remarkable, I want you to understand, that the blood is referred right like a scarlet thread running from the book of Genesis and become meaningful from the cross and, be, and such expounded and progressed to the point where it is central. 
In fact, when you go into the book of Revelation, it is over and over again, the lamb that was slain and the blood that was shed, you find it again and again, lest you and I forget how we went to heaven. God's grace by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is Calvary's cross. What is so remarkable, we don't have time to cover it all. But when you turn to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, tells you it was permanent. And that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the land that was slain from the foundation of the world. What is remarkable is there is such power in the blood. You remember the song, the blood will never, 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 never lose its power. But there is such a victory in the blood because it defeats the power of darkness. It's paid the price. The enemy can say nothing because blood for blood, it is not the blood of animal. It is the blood of the Lord himself. The spotless Lamb of God. And what you find in the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I want you to get up and testify the blood has saved me, the blood has cleansed me, the blood has healed me, the blood has uh, and helped me. If that is what it is, go ahead and say, thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. I declare, I testify the power there is in the blood of Jesus. It will never, 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 never lose its power. They overcame Satan. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. We're not talking just the present, but we're talking all the way in what would be the great tribulation. They overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word, by the word. You cannot have a testimony if you're not saved. You cannot say you are healed unless you have been healed. You can never say I've been delivered until you have a testimony of your deliverance. And by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of the Lamb, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for the precious blood of Jesus. You may be seated. The sixth point I want to make to you this morning is something very important, and that is called simply the old passing, and there is a new. What would be the testament cut in his blood, or that would be the new covenant? You know what I find interesting is the book of Hebrews tells, goes on to tell us in chapter 8 and verse 8, very interesting, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We're going beyond from the natural to the spiritual. Yes, there is the natural Israel, the physical Israel, but there's the spiritual Israel too. And very interestingly, when you turn what would be the book of Jeremiah that you find interesting in chapter 31, and read verse 31. 600 years before this took place, Jeremiah, the great prophet of Israel, the Hebrew prophet prophesying, says, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day I took them, talking about the Old Testament, the right hand, and led them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, but this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their heart and will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man to his neighbor because if you are saved and if you have the Spirit, it's within you. The law is not written in tablets of stone but in your heart that you might love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. Not just that, but Ezekiel also had written hundreds of years before in Ezekiel chapter 36. And we could read from verse 24. He goes on to say uh, 24, uh, I'm sorry, 36 and verse 24. And it, uh, but I will read from verse uh, 
24, I will t make you from among, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your hand, into your land. That is simply where we are at this point, from all over the world. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgment. That is what God had done. So when the Lord Jesus Christ was seated with his disciple on that last supper, he took the cup and he took the bread, and you can read that in either Matthew chapter 26, 28, or you can read it in Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. Let's take Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. This is, he said, the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This is cut permanently, and this is something that he has done, and our salvation is based on what Jesus did, a new testament, a new covenant cut in my blood. He said he did it for you and for me. And what a powerful way. I want to realize what happens is the old is gone, and suddenly you find the new come in. And very interestingly, if I could find this passage in Colossians chapter 2, and verse 14 onwards, listen to what Paul is saying, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing to his cross. Everything that condemned us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And he goes on to say, in verse, uh, where are we? In verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Now listen to what 16 says. Let no man therefore judge you in me. There's no harm. If you're awake and it's for your health reason, but it's not going to get you any closer to the Lord. It was just to keep the Old Testament people separate. I dare say it's good to follow some of this for health purposes, but not that you're going to be any closer or you get salvation from any one of this. So he says, don't let anyone judge you by, hey, you're awake and yeah, I'm really special to God. No, you're just awake and saved by the blood of Jesus. You're a non-vegetarian, saved by the blood of Jesus. Goes on to say, let no man judge you in drink on respect of a holy day. Oh, I keep this holy day. It is unto the Lord, but you are saved, not because of holy day. You are saved by God's grace, by the blood of the Lamb. Nor in respect of new moon, the Old Testament, they were in terms of lunar, not solar. Or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of reward and voluntary humiliation, worshiping of angels, integrating those things we had not seen, vainly puffed up by fleshly mind, not holding the head. You've forgotten all of this and forgot it is all about the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just say something very important, and that is number seven. And this is what took place was what would be from the law of Moses of Mount Sinai, we are put into the law of Jesus Christ of Calvary. On Golgotha, when he said it's finished, and the temple was rent, his body was pierced and blood poured out, and you find it is a New Testament. I want you to understand, when you talk about the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ was asked in Matthew chapter 22, and reading from verse 37, about what would be the greatest law. Hoping that he would say number five, number four, number three, number seven. But listen to what Jesus said in verse 37. Jesus said unto them, this is most important, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That fulfills law number one, law number two, law number three, 
law number four. If you love God, you won't take his name in vain. If you love God, you won't bow down before idols. If you love God, four of the first four commandments are obeyed because love is more important. You can do it voluntarily, you can do it habitually, but not with love. But here, yeah, because you have love. And then he goes on to say in verse 39, the second law. And the second law is this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. In that is summed that because you love your wife, you won't commit adultery. Because you love the, your neighbor, you won't kill him. Because you love your neighbor, you won't put false witness against him. Because you love your neighbor, you won't steal. And your neighbor is not the one nearest to you alone, but the one, the one that is most hated and far is away from you. And so what does he say in 22 and verse 40 of Matthew? He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. In one shot, he tells you the entire thing is fulfilled. In 37, love the Lord. And 39, love your neighbor. The first four and the last six, ten commandments in just love. And so the Lord Jesus saying, I give you a new commandment. It's not new. And John talks about it several times in the epistle. John chapter 14, uh, John chapter 13 and verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Very interesting because when you read about this, there's something very important that you find the law of Christ. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, Christ is the end of the law. That's the bus stop. That is period. Christ is the end of the law. It is moved into a greater, higher dimension. You mean to say, I can kill? Absolutely not. You can't even hate him. Oh, you mean I don't need to give praise to God? Are you crazy? If they did it by law, you're doing it from within. Not for salvation because you are saved. You are willingly, openly saying, I want to. That is from your heart. And if you don't, examine your heart if you're born again. There's something else I wanted to realize, something very important when you read these passages. This is what Paul is saying, and he's talking about being Jewish, but he's now come to the place that is unique because he's not only can live under those under law, and he can still live those without law. And in both of them, he is not in lasciviousness or sinful, pushing the envelope, but simply saying he can do it because he lives by a higher law, the law of God, the law of Jesus Christ. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, the entire passage is important, but let's, for clarity and time, let's talk about it in verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 20. And unto the Jews, I became a Jew. Paul, I thought you were Jewish. He is beyond Jewish. He says, I became as a Jew. You are a Jew. No, I became a Jew. That I might gain the Jews and to them that are under the law. You're not under the law. As under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Them that are outside the law as without law, being not without law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them. So the law of Christ is higher and greater, far big and higher notch than the laws of Moses or now. The laws of Moses is not bad, it's good, it's a pointer. It's a school teacher. It's a mirror that tells, oops, I look horrible. I need to do something. I need to wash myself. I need to comb. But the law of Moses doesn't help you outward, but the law of Christ from inward through the Holy Spirit works and prompts you. That is interesting because there's also what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. He says, take somebody's burden, bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Moses? No. The law of Christ. That's very interesting. So you find in this the law of Christ, the law of... But when you go into um, Romans, Romans chapter 
8 and verse 2, there's the law of spirit that works in our own spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Excuse me, what are you saying? Let me read it again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the bondages. I didn't wake up at four and praise God. I'm damned. I'm doomed. I'm gonna. No, my friend, what time did you wake up? Ten. Start praising in God at ten. You do not lose your salvation. Don't be bound by it. You can still praise him at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, in the subway, at work, wherever you can. Because you are living about the law. It's in your heart to praise the Lord. It's in your heart to give to God. It's in your heart to help your neighbor. It's in your heart. You're not compelled, beaten down. It comes from yourself. Ever so often I hear prophecy. Praise me, praise me, praise me, said the Lord. You should be praising the Lord. Give, give, give. You should be giving to the Lord. What I say is, you must be motivated because of the love of God and because you're saved. It's from within your heart. And it's important for us to realize that. You know, when you think of what Paul said, it's very interesting. He thinks the law of Moses and then the law of Christ. But look at the description. There's nothing negative about, but the law of Moses has saved no one. It led us, it's brought us, it's pointed us, it's a school teacher, it showed us our mistake, our failures, our moral lapses, our uh, duty towards God and all that we failed, but it hasn't saved us. It only points us to the Savior. It's a pointer, it's a sign, it's a signal saying he's the one. And so when you look at what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7, Paul said, think about it, he calls it the ministration of death. What? But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, what stones is he talking about? Stones was glorious, that is, the law of Moses written on ten tab on the two tablets. If that was glorious, that the children of Israel could steadfastly behold the face of Moses for a while, but that glory departed. If that was glorious, let me read it again. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in the stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory? was to be done away with. But listen to what it says about verse 8. How? How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? That is incredible. That is amazing. So what is the writer saying? He tells us, let me show you a new and a better way. Thank God for the old path. Thank God for the old. That is the reason those types, the shadows, the symbols pointed me and veered me into the New Testament. If it was not for the old, I would not have known the new. The old contains the laws and messages. But the new reveals what those parables and messages are and reveals us through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what a marvelous way it tells us that his, the very moment the temple sacrifices were made by Caiaphas or the priest, and the moment the animal was slit at the throat and blood was taken by a vessel, and that would be applied for the sins of the people, that very moment the blood was split when the, when the spear tore and split the body of Jesus, and blood poured out, and it was contained. And what is interesting is, that blood was taken to the mercy seat in heaven, not on earth. And that is so important, that blood will never lose 
its power. Give the Lord a clap offering. And very interesting, let me read what the writer of Hebrews says. We read it, but just so that we get a grip of it, it is so powerful that when we read chapter 10, and let me read from 19 onwards once again, chapter 10, verse 19, and here is what he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of holiest, that is the most holy place, the holiest of holiest by the blood of Jesus. What's he saying? Far superior, far greater, more perfect. And he says, by a new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his body is flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to our profession or confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and to good, good works. Talk about what he has done. Not forsaking, not by watching over television, COVID has come and gone. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day of this one who died is going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What is so interesting is in chapter 4, and he goes on to say something so dramatic. In chapter 4 and verse 14, seeing that we have a great high priest that has passed unto heavens, now from earth and down from the earth, he rose and he went to heaven. Seeing that we have a great high priest that has passed unto heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession, our confession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feeling of our infirmities, but was in all manner and all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Listen to what he says. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy in time of need. And that is what we are going to do today. If there be any sin, every one of us are. Every one of us are unworthy. And I dare say everyone. And we need to realize we need the blood. Let nothing keep you if you're born again. And this is only for, there's no magic in the communion. In fact, there is what would be a blessing and a curse if you take it rightly and wrongly. And what it simply means, you must be born again. You must approach it discerning the Lord's body and understand this is for you. Not that anyone is worthy, but that when we examine ourselves and come short, ask the Lord to forgive us. Critical, judging, or maybe something that upset us. God have mercy, I blew it again. But I come and confess my sin and ask you to cleanse me. What I want you to know is what God says in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, thus saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. What he tells us is so wonderfully, come and dine. John 21 and verse 12. What he tells us so remarkably in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, the cup that we, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Jesus Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And what do we do when we partake of it? We look back. 2,000 years ago, just as the Hebrew church looked forward by faith to the one that would be the fulfillment of the shadow, the type, and symbols. And we look back at not a prefigure, but simply the one that is come to pass. The reality, the one 
Yeshua Amashiach. And we look back and say, thank you, God, for what you have done. We look present to say, the blood is still powerful to cleanse me, that we have access to the Father and to one another. But we look forward to what is going to be looking forward and cleansing and keep ourselves right, because looking for the great and marvelous return of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26 very rightfully and strongly says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth, you do proclaim to the seen and to the unseen world, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. As you do it in the present, his death that took place 2,000 years ago and looking forward to till he comes, shall we stand. Even before you say this prayer of blessing, say with me, Father, I seek your forgiveness. I'm not worthy, but by the blood of Jesus, and only on the ground of the blood of Jesus, that he has covered me with righteousness, I'm cleansed. I ask your forgiveness, and I seek you today. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your love. This is a cup of blessing that I bless, that it would bless me as I bless the family, as I bless your people, and I partake of this in Jesus' name. Let us eat of the bread and drink of this cup in the name of Jesus.